I'm delighted to welcome Mairead Ford, who's a parent and a member of the steering committee of the National Platform of Self-Advocates. Um, in the middle, we have Michael Brown, who's a freelance researcher and policy analyst um, with a particular interest in the human rights approach to policy and provisions relating to people with intellectual or cognitive impairment across the age spectrum. Um, and he's worked on many um, different publications and research evaluation reports and discussion papers. And then beside him, we have Louise Ward, who's a senior advocate with the National Advocacy Service for People with Disabilities in the Western Region, um, the National Advocacy Service for People with Dis Disabilities at Independent Free Confidential Service, and Louise will tell us more about her role within that, while Michael will give us the human rights approach, and Mairead and I are now going to talk about her role as a parent. So Mairead, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, I'm going to ask you, can you tell us about your, your son? Um, my son's, my, my son's name is Patrick. He was born on the 10th of November 2003. Oh, that's, thank you. That's the first question. Yeah, that's right. So um, I have, what was he like as a baby? Um, he was a nine pound baby. He was a good feeder, but suffered from colic for about three months. I got lots of advice from the public health nurse and my local GP as I am living with my mother and my father. I got great support from them and my sister. Great, yeah, because I was wondering about what kind of support you had. So and I forgot to ask, he's 15 years old. 15, great. So a teenager now, yeah. full of trouble, no doubt. Yes. <laughs> and how, how did you find school? How did you find school supportive for him? Um, he... He had problems when he became primary school. We had we were advised to have him um, assessed by a psychologist in Cork and was diagnosed with ADHD and mild learning disability with speech and language and occupational therapy needs. He found the homework difficult. Okay, yeah, he found homework difficult, yeah, so you had yeah. to engage different supports. Yeah, because he had to... He wouldn't do it with the help of my mother because I was trying to kind of do it with him and he won't settle okay. to sit down to do it. So you were able to, t you were got advice to turn to extra supports yeah, to try and help? Yeah, actually my mother that was actually helping him with the homework more than I would. Okay. Because I found it difficult. Yeah, difficult to help out. And did Patrick find secondary school very different to primary? Um, yeah. No, this was another one. Uh, Sorry, we're asked still on uh, this school support. Yeah, um, yeah, do you know what number, oh, what was number five? Don't worry. We're um, asking is, is how school was supportive towards you. Yeah, um, yes, the school principal and teachers were wonderful and he also had an SNE. They helped him to make friends and get involved with all the games. He is very good at reading and spelling. Great, and, yeah. is he, and does he like sport? He does. Yeah. Football. Football <laughs> yeah. And is he, does he follow a particular team? Uh, no, not a particular team. He watch soccer all right. Okay. Do you know him play soccer games? So Gaelic football? Gaelic football, yeah. And is the, is the GA um, pitch close to your home? Uh, yes. Very Just um, up the road. <laughs> Good. So you can go whatever training or twice. Sometimes it could be six miles into the nearest town. Okay. Yeah. So you'd have to because go by car. Combined with them and Tom, Milstead and Colin. Okay. Yeah. So it's 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 an ordeal to get him there yeah. to training sometimes. Or neighbour kind to take some. Sometimes they take some. Great. With a couple of friends. <laughs> Great. They help out and, and yeah. support. And are we on to how did he? Uh, secondary. How did he get on in secondary uh, school? Yes, he did at the start. Found it difficult to to adjust. To adjust, yeah. He is now attending the Patrician Academy in Mallow in County Cork. It took him a long time to get to know the staff and all and the new friends. He leaves home at twenty to eight in the morning by bus and returns around five. It's a long day. He finds some subjects difficult. He likes PE, woodwork and art. Great. And it, is there other supports that he... So he likes woodwork and art and... Yeah, and but you see, he's in an English class, a mainstream English class, and he's no SNE towards that, and we're, they're trying to get an SNE to... To support him. To support him, because he finds it. 
difficult. Hard. And how is he at home? As a teenager, is he difficult? Yes, <laughs> to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you have to lock the PlayStation, I believe, and lock it up. Yes, we do during school or school time, yeah. Sounds like he's been well disciplined anyway. <laughs> Try. We have to lock the room and still... It's all you can do with teenagers, really, is it? <laughs> yeah. And last question, I mean, what do you hope for Patrick's future? Um, my hope for Patrick's future is that he will be able to take his exams and hopefully get further training that he will be able to get work. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Well done. Thank you. Thanks now, and I'll hand you over to Michael Brown, who will present here on the... I think his presentation was here a second ago. Oh, my God, I just put that up to you there. That's it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, first of all, can I say that um, I'm um, very happy to be here uh, and today and to be uh, part of what I consider to be a very, very important um, uh, initiative and one that I think will uh, deliver a lot in the future. And secondly, can I say that I'm privileged to be here as perhaps one of the few males uh, and perhaps to have a little bit uh, of, of, even a small bit of gender balance in the debate, but we do need more men in here, so I hope the project gets them on board, okay? Um, so I just want to talk briefly uh, uh, about what I would call a framework, a, a, a policy and a rights framework, which provides a context for all that you have been talking about uh, uh, today. In other words, you've been talking about the practice and the challenges. I want to, I suppose, highlight you know, the framework that is there, which uh, creates a context uh, for you pursuing uh, and looking for best practice and best, best responses. Uh, I want to say a little bit about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that you're all aware of, no doubt, and uh, the right to family life included in that. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, some of the, um, uh, briefly about some of the Irish policies relating to that. I want to talk about, very briefly, about um, the barriers to effective parenting identified in terms of people with an intellectual disability. And finally, I want to just introduce uh, the crucial role of advocacy, which Louise, who was coming after me, will talk about uh, uh, her uh, the practice in that regard. So first of all, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with, with Disabilities. Um, that uh, in there, there is a, the recognition of the right of all persons with disabilities who are of marriageable age to marry and to found a family on the basis of free and full consent. I'm not sure about the, the marriageable age now and, and marry. Maybe that language perhaps is a bit dated, I'm not sure, but that, that, that's what's there. The second one then that I want to draw attention to is that people with disabilities have a right to decide freely and responsibly on the number and spacing of their children. So obviously uh, uh, um, that brings in a whole lot of dimensions that you've been talking about this morning, uh, um, including uh, obviously the right to assistive uh, reproduction services and the right to abortion and termination services. So they're both sides. So uh, in terms of that freely and responsibly. Secondly, have access to age appropriate information, reproductive and family planning education, and have the means necessary to enable them to ex exercise these rights. And I think that's pretty crucial, and that's by and large, I think, what uh, the discussion uh, uh, all day to day has been about. Um, final point there is persons with disabilities, including children, retain their fertility on an equal basis with others. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, I hope that the, uh, the sort of um, uh, negative practices that were in vogue in the past are long since gone. I don't know uh, where people uh, um, weren't uh, allowed to retain their fertility, but I, I, I say I hope it, it, it is long gone. Um, states parties shall render appropriate assistance to persons with disabilities in the performance of their child-rearing responsibilities. I think that's crucial, that 
states should support parents with disabilities you know, to carry out their child rearing responsibilities. Again, sometimes uh, there are huge issues there, again, as was highlighted earlier, earlier today. And finally, in no case shall a child be separated from parents on the basis of a disability of either the child or one or both of, of uh, the parents. Again, that's strong, a strong provision there in that, in that convention. I now want to move on uh, uh, briefly to talk about the Child Care Act 1991, which is the piece of legislation governing policy in Ireland. Uh, TUSLA, the, uh, the Child and Family Agency, has a statutory duty to promote the welfare of children who are not receiving adequate care and protection. I think everybody would, would agree with that. Secondly, they have a, a responsibility to provide child care and family support service with the aim of helping parents to care for their children and to avoid the need for such children to be taken into care. Uh, again, uh, uh, that quality and nature and extent of that support in terms of people uh, with the disability or with other uh, mental health difficulties or whatever, uh, I, I think that, that uh, the Act implies that that support will be there for all parents. Um, it is generally in the best interest of the child to be brought up in his or her own family. That's a fairly obvious statement, I think. But while the Act emphasises the provision of family support services in order to do that uh, within the home and in a preventative and a proactive manager, it may be the case and possibly is certainly the case, that resource constraints result in current child protection practice uh, to be reactive rather than proactive in nature. In other words, the services only intervene when there's a difficulty or a problem. Um, Children First guidelines introduced in Ireland in 2011 again uh, created, uh, I suppose, the, the, the environment, the climate, the context uh, for protecting uh, children. Again, ensuring that the welfare of children uh, and where possible and appropriate, enabling children to remain in their own families. Again, that's the dominant uh, 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 principle there. Uh, this is a, a good one, I think, optimizing parenting capacity. So in other words, uh, uh, rather than starting where people are perhaps at, uh, you, you obviously, and leave it at that, you identify what people's needs are, and you would uh, work towards developing their potential and their capacity to parent. Again, uh, um, I don't think that that happens to the extent that it should or it might. Um, then achieving the right balance between ensuring that children are fully protected and the provision of parenting supports. In other words, of course, child protection issues will always be a concern, but that has to be balanced with providing the necessary and required adequate and appropriate supports uh, to parents, in other words, to, to, to uh, uh, provide uh, an in-family remedy where there is uh, um, perhaps uh, um, um, a threat to children's uh, 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 in whatever way. And child protection concerns must always give, be given priority. And again, I think that's fairly, fairly um, uh, obvious uh, as a principle. I want to now move on now fairly quickly to talk about uh, barriers to effective parenting uh, for people with an intellectual disability, which have been identified, and this is primarily from UK research. And I'll just go through that list uh, there fairly, fairly quickly. Um, the first one is negative expectations about their parenting ability. Parenting difficulties are automatically linked to learning difficulty. And uh, I think, again, we have heard that this morning in terms of not just learning disability, but other types of disability as well. So negative expectations, again, a huge barrier. Assumptions, and the second one there, assumptions that people with intellectual disability could never be good enough parents. And we heard the concept this morning, good enough, not perfect, but good enough, but the assumptions that they could never be good enough. Um, and that their capacity to parent cannot improve. Um, the third point there is low self-esteem and lack of confidence on the part of parents with an intellectual disability because of previous negative experiences with the system, so to speak. In other words, uh, people, people uh, feeling that the system was, uh, in a sense, not particularly helpful or supportive. Uh, the next point there is the use of IQ levels, IQ levels as a proxy for parenting ability without a detailed assessment 
of their abilities and support needs. In other words, an assessment is done of their uh, IQ levels and uh, assumptions made on, on, on that part uh, according to one dimension only. Um, the next one, lack of clarity and consistency among different professionals involved on what constitutes good parenting or what constitutes good enough parenting. Um, the second last point there, mainstream services not equipped to work with parents with learning difficulties. And I think that probably would be uh, replicated very much in Ireland as well. In other words, the mainstream social work services do not have perhaps the education, training or skills, I hope I'm wrong there, to work with people uh, um, with uh, intellectual disability or complex mental health difficulties, uh, uh, which requires, I think, specific skill sets, which m maybe parents, uh, uh, other parents do not have. And the final one there is parents fearful of asking for help with their parenting uh, in the sense that there is a fear that their children will be removed if they seek help. And again, you can see or understand why that can be uh, um, a major, a major uh, factor. So, uh, uh, in, in other words, avoid the system because they'll take your children from you. Um, I just want to refer briefly to our research, research uh, uh, and that uh, relating to the uh, child protection uh, court system, that parents with an intellectual dis disability and or mental health difficulties, they account for a relatively high proportion of child protection cases in the courts. Some 15% of cases reported by the Child Care Law Reporting Project, that was the uh, project that Carol Coulter was in, involved in or directed for a number of years, and that referred to parents with a disability, predominantly cognitive and or mental health difficulties, so 15%. And you can look at that research there on that, on that uh, uh, link, link there if, if you want. I think it's, 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 it's interesting it's, uh, in relation to that particular point. It's interesting anyway in terms of the whole child care uh, court system, but it's interested specifically on that point. Um, I finally want just to move and say a little bit about uh, um, the, uh, the crucial role of advocacy, because I suppose in many respects what uh, you have been saying uh, um, today uh, has been the importance of giving voice uh, to, people, uh, to people's will and preferences. And I think the crucial role in ad in, of advocacy in giving that voice or in facilitating that voice to be heard. Uh, some people can do it on their own, many people cannot, and they need uh, help with that, with that, um, uh, 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 with that voice. Um, I think that's particularly important where there is a question of uh, you know, capacity assessment comes into play and the need again for supports uh, to be there to, in a sense, to ensure that that capacity uh, is full, it's comprehensive, it's integrated and is multidimensional. Uh, obviously, advocacy needs to be timely, you know, there when needed. It needs to be independent. Uh, uh, it needs to be uh, integrated into the policy and legal processes, not just an add-on. It needs to be an integral part of that system in order to deliver on the, uh, the rights that uh, uh, I referred to earlier. And finally, it needs to be available to people, uh, both in terms of uh, accessing parenting supports commensurate with needs. In other words, people on their own very often are not able to le le leverage the kind of supports that they require to uh, be effective parents or to be good enough parents. And I think that's crucial important, uh, crucially important because it's not just good enough uh, uh, um, to bring in that uh, advocacy support uh, uh, um, in the child, in, when, when it comes to a case of child care proceedings and child care orders being sought. And I think that's the last point I want to make. Advocacy is, of course, crucially important there. Uh, and uh, I think on that uh, note, I will uh, uh, finish and say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. And one thing I took from that is about optimizing parenting capacity and potential. And I think that's a really nice thing to, to focus on and take from your, from your talk. And now I'll hand you over to Louise, please. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to echo Micah's comments and what a privilege it is to speak at this conference today and to meet with the project team and the other speakers. It has been a, a really tremendous event and I look forward to seeing the, the results of the project as time goes on. 
Um, I'm Louise Ward. I'm Senior Advocate with the National Advocacy Service for People with Disabilities. And uh, our mission statement states that the National Advocacy Service for People with Disabilities provides an independent, confidential and free advocacy service that works exclusively for adults with disabilities. Our role is to work with those who may be isolated from their community of choice or mainstream society, may communicate differently, and who may have limited informal or natural supports. We act as a catalyst for change through collaboration, capacity building, and representation to make the rights of people with disabilities a reality. And parents with a disability regularly meet NAS eligibility criteria, as they're often isolated from their community and lack supports. And in 2017, we engaged in full representative advocacy with 852 people, and 13% of these cases were provision of advocacy support to people with disabilities involved in court proceedings relating to their children. And we work with people with, of all disabilities. Um, the NAS experience of cases with parents with disabilities demonstrates the importance of providing independent supports for parents with disabilities to ensure that they have a full and fair understanding of the process. Parents with disabilities should be empowered and facilitated to have their voices, wills and preferences meaningfully heard in a child protection process. The key issues we come across in childcare cases are that parents with disabilities are disproportionately affected by interventions by social services in relation to their family lives. And as Michael said, you know, automatically someone's disability is considered a risk factor in, by social services. The child protection court system provides inadequate supports to parents with disabilities to ensure they have sufficient time, capacity and understanding to consider documentation and present their perspective as a parent. Parents with disabilities frequently face increased levels of poverty and social inclusion by virtue of a lack of supports and resources from disability services. There is a lack of recognition that increasing supports for parents with disabilities from disability services in the HSC can enhance children's outcomes. And we would note that there is a significant power imbalance between parents with disabilities and authorities when engaging with TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency and the courts. Advocacy can assist in addressing that imbalance and ensuring that the parent with a disability can effectively engage in the proceedings. And it's important to note that advocates do not seek particular outcomes in childcare proceedings, but rather we seek to ensure fairness and meaningful engagement by parents with disabilities in the process. Advocates work with parents with disabilities in the following settings, in court proceedings, childcare case review meetings, in, in private or informal arrangements, and we support parents through complaints processes about TUSLA and the HSE. NAS casework with people with dis parents with disabilities has demonstrated that there is a need for parents with disabilities to have supports and assistance through childcare proceedings. And often the NAS advocate is the only person supporting the parent outside of the court process. There is a huge benefit to the person by having an advocate involved in their childcare proceedings. NAS advocates allow for the parent to have the time needed to explain their side of things. We can work to ensure that there is access to a fair process. We take an inclusive, non-judgmental approach. We can support the parent to broaden their understanding of the situation, and we bring an understanding of the person's processing from spending time with them and get a broader, getting a broader understanding of how they view things. NAS advocates focus specifically on the person. Advocates can bring specialist disability knowledge and expertise. We use a strengths-based approach, empowering parents to express themselves. By engagement with the person in different environments, inside and outside of court, advocates can verify what the parent's will and preferences are, and we can provide a fuller context of the parent's whole life to support solicitors to be active in challenging issues. And the work that an AS advocate, the work that we would actually complete with, with parents with disabilities includes supporting understanding of court proceedings and the parent's rights regarding voluntary and statutory care orders and access. We support the parent to make informed choices and exploration of options and communicating these choices, wishes or decisions to the relevant parties. We represent a person's wishes regarding access arrangements and we support with understanding the roles of all the professionals involved. And often there is a huge changeover in staff within the two of the Child and Family Agency and sometimes it can be very difficult to understand who's who and what their role is, so we can support with that. 
During meetings with social work department and with legal representative, the advocate supports understanding the content of discussions and supports full participation for the person, as well as support with challenging and clarifying inaccurate information. Support we support with understanding and responding to content within court documents, such as social work reports and assessments, psychology assessments, etc. And we support understanding and participation in child protection meetings, child plan, care plan reviews, and case conferences. And it's important to note that there is a merit in the advocacy process itself. Advocates are not pursuing particular outcomes for parents with disabilities, as I said before, but we work to empower people through the process. And as we've all discussed throughout the day, we encounter a lot of difficulties in childcare cases. Uh, one of the difficulties is accessible communication. In cases where the person has literacy issues or difficulty processing information, it has often been the role of the advocate to break the information down into an accessible format and perhaps use visual format or look at tools such as diaries to keep up with changing information. And while TUSLA may acknowledge the person requires additional support, this is often not reflected in communications, and often it is assumed that the advocate will fulfill this responsibility rather than the social workers making the information accessible to begin with. And of course, under the Equal Status Act, there is an obligation in all public, all public bodies to provide for reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities in providing public services, and this obligation to provide reasonable accommodation applies to TUSLA, the court system, and the Legal Aid Board. Access to information can be a difficulty. Uh, access to information in a timely manner is not uh, often afforded in cases, and this places the parent with a disability at a disproportionate disadvantage in terms of having access to and appropriate time to process the information contained in key reports in advance of court. The reviewing of sensitive reports very often takes place on the steps of a courthouse in the morning of an already stressful day for the person. And we as advocates often advocate that uh, reports be requested and available in advance of court to be reviewed by the parent and their advocate, perhaps with their solicitor or in accommodations to be made at TUSLA offices. Parents with disabilities face challenges where they, are, they have inadequate time to process information. Often parents with disabilities are only informed about important decisions by social workers immediately prior to or during an important meeting, for example, in a childcare conference. And this puts the parent with a disability at a serious disadvantage, as often they need time to process what has been said by the social work team. Um, when we would get involved in cases, parents would often tell us that they left a meeting regretting they did not say the right thing, or indeed to have the opportunity to consider and prepare a response. Parents with disabilities may often agree to certain requests without fully understanding the consequences because of a lack of time to process and consider the consequences of the decision. Advocacy can seek to redress this. Stakeholder engagement with advocates. There is a variation in the level of cooperation between social workers and advocates across the country. While some social workers would engage very well with us, in other cases, social workers do not engage as well. And Michael talked about capacity assessments. Specialist parental capacity reports and other professional reports make recommendations in terms of appropriateness of a child remaining in care of the parent or the care of the state. And TUSLA will use these reports and regularly reference the conclusion in terms of parental capacity. And these are often very deficit-based. Despite relying on these parent capacity reports, TUSLA does not necessarily follow the support recommendations that these reports make. The reports often recommend that certain supports be provided to support capacity building of the parent. The report often states which supports should be made available to the parent to work towards family reunification. And we as advocates find securing these supports in terms of funding very difficult. TUSLA do not always prioritise accessing recommended supports and the advocate, the person and their legal team have to push for progress in this regard. And in terms of legal support, there are particular difficulties around the access for parents with disabilities to legal advice or support at a pre-birth stage. And a broader issue which many advocates report are cases where the parent is fully committed to the processes involved in the childcare proceedings and fully engaged with the service, but there remains a reluctance on the part of TUSLA to work towards family reunification. Often TUSLA will report that they're very satisfied with the placement where the child resides and a considerable amount of time may have passed. TUSLA will state that then that it is in the child's best interest to remain in that placement and not to be reunified with their parents. And finally, one of the, another difficulty would be the length of time in court. 
Attending court for people with disabilities is very strenuous. People can be in court for durations of over five hours, which could be extremely stressful for parents with disabilities who have little experience of the court system. And the last court case I was at was just in March. We arrived at half nine and we left at half 8 p.m. that evening. We only got called at 7 p.m. to be heard. So it's, it's a huge issue. Um, there are very limited supports for parents with, with, with disabilities, and NAS currently, do, you know, we do face challenges in meeting the demand, expectations, and complexity of childcare cases, which is unfortunate because NAS has worked on so many cases, and feedback from people with disabilities and professionals has noted the central and essential role which advocacy brings to the process surrounding childcare cases. We have been very successful in empowering parents with disabilities throughout the process, despite the, the limited resources that we have. And finally, these are our details. If you wanted to make an inquiry in such a case, we have our national line and we have our email there as well where you can make a general inquiry. Thanks a million. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. That was great to hear the work of NAS and the role that they have. If we have any questions from the floor, we'd be delighted to, to take them.